The White Doe Once in a bygone era, a king and queen shared a deep love, finding perfect happiness in each other's company. Yet, their joy remained incomplete, for the absence of a little son or daughter to bring laughter and play into their lives. Though they never openly expressed this longing, whenever their eyes fell upon the children of others, a subtle sadness crept across their faces, known only to their closest courtiers and attendants. On a particular day, the queen sought solace beside a waterfall within the expansive park surrounding the castle. Overwhelmed by a heightened sense of melancholy, she dismissed her attendants, craving solitude for her sorrow. Suddenly, a rustling in the pool beneath the waterfall caught her attention. Upon looking up, she beheld a sizable crab ascending a stone beside her. Great Queen, spoke the crab, I am here to inform you that the yearning of your heart will soon be fulfilled. However, before this comes to pass, permit me to guide you to the palace of the fairies. Although it lies nearby, mortal eyes have never glimpsed it due to the thick clouds that enshroud its existence. There, you shall gain further insight if you dare trust yourself to me. Never before had the queen encountered a speaking creature, leaving her momentarily speechless with astonishment. Nonetheless, captivated by the crab's words, she smiled warmly and extended her hand. To her surprise, the hand was not grasped by the crab but by a petite old woman, elegantly attired in white and crimson with green ribbons adorning her gray hair. Remarkably, not a single drop of water clung to her attire. The old woman led the queen along a familiar path, though it now appeared transformed. Instead of wrestling with nettles and brambles, the queen found herself surrounded by roses and jasmine, the air permeated with the sweet scent of violets beneath her feet. Towering orange trees provided ample shade, preventing the sun's midday intensity. At the path's end, a radiant glow beckoned, forcing the queen to shield her eyes and peer through her fingers. What might that be, inquired the queen, turning to her guide, who replied, that is the fairies' palace, and here come some of them to greet us. As she spoke the gates swung back and six fairies approached, each bearing in her hand a flower made of precious stones, but so like a real one that it was only by touching you could tell the difference. Madame, they said, we know not how to thank you for this mark of your confidence, but have the happiness to tell you that in a short time you will have a little daughter. Adi. The queen was so enchanted at this news that she nearly fainted with joy, but when she was able to speak, she poured out all her gratitude to the fairies for their promised gift. And now, she said, I ought not to stay any longer for my husband will think that I have run away, or that some evil beast has devoured me. In a little while it happened just as the fairy's hat foretold, and a baby girl was born in the palace. Of course both the king and queen were delighted, and the child was called Desiree, which means desired, for she had been desired for five years before her birth. Adi. At first the queen could think of nothing but her new plaything, but then she remembered the fairies who had sent it to her. Bidding her ladies bring her the posy of jeweled flowers which had been given her at the palace, she took each flower in her hand and called it by name, and, in turn, each fairy appeared before her. But, as unluckily often happens, the one to whom she owed the most, the crab fairy, was forgotten, and by this, as in the case of other babies you have read about, much mischief was wrought. Adi. However, for the moment all was gaiety in the palace, 
and everybody in sight ran to the windows to watch the fairies' carriages, for no two were alike. One had a car of ebony, drawn by white pigeons, another was lying back in her ivory chariot, driving ten black crows, while the rest had chosen rare woods or many-colored seashells, with scarlet and blue macaws, long-tailed peacocks, or green lovebirds for horses. These carriages were only used on occasions of state, for when they went to war flying dragons, fiery serpents, lions or leopards, took the place of the beautiful birds. Adi. The fairies entered the queen's chamber followed by little dwarfs who carried their presents and looked much prouder than their mistresses. One by one their burdens were spread upon the ground, and no one had ever seen such lovely things. Everything that a baby could possibly wear or play with was there, and besides, they had other and more precious gifts to give her, which only children who have fairies for godmothers can ever hope to possess. They were all gathered round the heap of pink cushions on which the baby lay asleep, when a shadow seemed to fall between them and the sun, while a cold wind blew through the room. Everybody looked up, and there was the crab fairy, who had grown as tall as the ceiling in her anger. Adi. So I am forgotten, cried she, in a voice so loud that the queen trembled as she heard E.T. Who was it soothed you in your trouble? Who was it let you to the fairies? Who was it brought you back in safety to your home again? Yet I am overlooked, while these who have done nothing in comparison, are petted and thanked. The queen, almost dumb with terror, in vain tried to think of some explanation or apology, but there was none, and she could only confess her fault and implore forgiveness. The fairies also did their best to soften the wrath of their sister, and knowing that, like many plain people who are not fairies, she was very vain, they entreated her to drop her crab's disguise, and to become once more the charming person they were accustomed to see. Adi. For some time the enraged fairy would listen to nothing, but at length the flatteries began to take effect. The crab's shell fell from her, she shrank into her usual size, and lost some of her fierce expression. Well, she said, I will not cause the prince's death, as I had meant to do, but at the same time she will have to bear the punishment of her mother's fault, as many other children have done before her. The sentence I pass upon her is, that if she is allowed to see one ray of daylight before her fifteenth birthday she will rue it bitterly, and it may perhaps cost her her life. And with these words she vanished by the window through which she came, while the fairies comforted the weeping queen and took counsel how best the princess might be kept safe during her childhood. After the lapse of half an hour, their deliberations concluded, and under the enchanting directive of the fairies, a resplendent palace materialized in proximity to that of the monarch and queen. This architectural marvel differed markedly from any palace in existence, eschewing windows entirely and boasting only an earthbound entrance. However, within its confines, the absence of daylight was inconspicuous, overshadowed by the brilliance emanating from numerous flickering tapers adorning the walls. Until this juncture, the princess's narrative mirrored that of countless royal progenies found in literary tales. Yet, as her period of captivity neared its end, the trajectory of her fortunes took a divergent course. The fairies had diligently tended to her for almost fifteen years, fostering her intellect, entertaining her, and imparting knowledge. Thus, upon her emergence into the world, she would rival, if not surpass, other regal daughters in the endowments that render a princess captivating and accomplished. 
Though they all held her in deep affection, it was the fairy Tulip who harbored the profoundest love. Approaching the princess's fifteenth birthday, Tulip couldn't help but quiver with trepidation, fearing unforeseen calamities. Do not let her out of your sight, Tulip cautioned the queen, and in the interim, commission a portrait to be painted and dispatched to neighboring courts, adhering to tradition. Let the kings witness her unparalleled beauty and vie for her hand in marriage for their progeny. And so it transpired. As prophesied by the fairy, the allure of the princess captivated all the young princes who beheld the portrait. However, the final prince to lay ice upon it was utterly captivated, refusing to part with the image, fixating on it for entire days. The king, noticing the inexplicable transformation in his son's demeanor, typically engrossed in pursuits such as hunting and hawking, overheard courtiers expressing concerns about the prince's seemingly erratic behavior. With alacrity, the king visited his son, only to witness the young man prostrating himself at his feet, decrying the betrothal imposed upon him and beseeching the king to seek the hand of Princess Desiree. Faced with the prospect of breaking a prearranged marriage, a decision fraught with the potential for prolonged conflict, the king, silent for the moment, withdrew in the hope that time might restore reason to his son. Yet, the prince's condition rapidly deteriorated, compelling the king, in desperation, to promise an immediate embassy to Desiree's father. The announcement swiftly cured the prince of his affliction. He eagerly immersed himself in planning every detail of the ambassadorial retinue led by Bikasig, envisioning a display of opulence in attire, horses, and carriages. Despite his fervent desire to participate incognito as a page, the king forbade it, leaving the prince to content himself with scouring the kingdom for rare and exquisite offerings for the princess. Just as the embassy prepared to depart, he arrived with a clandestinely painted portrait by the court artist. The king and queen, desiring a union with such a prestigious family, warmly welcomed the ambassador. They were inclined to introduce him to Princess Desiree, but the fairy Tulip intervened, apprehensive of potential repercussions. Inform him, Tulip insisted, that the marriage cannot be solemnized until she reaches 15 years of age, or a dire misfortune may befall the child. When Bikasig formally proposed that Princess Desiree be wed to his master's son, the king expressed honor and willingness to consent but stipulated that none could lay ice on the princess until her fifteenth birthday. The ambassador, though surprised and disappointed, acquainted with the capricious nature of fairies, acquiesced. Consequently, he presented the prince's portrait to the queen, who promptly delivered it to the princess. As she cradled the portrait, it spoke, articulating a compliment of exquisite finesse that elicited a rosy flush of pleasure from the princess. How would you like to have a husband like that? asked the queen, laughing. As if I knew anything about husbands, replied Desiree who had long ago guessed the business of the ambassador. Well, he will be your husband in three months, answered the queen, ordering the prince's presents to be brought in. The princess was very pleased with them, and admired them greatly, but the queen noticed that all the while her eyes constantly strayed from the softest silks and most brilliant jewels to the portrait of the prince. Adi the ambassador, finding that there was no hope of his being allowed to see the princess, took his leave, and returned to his own court, but here a new difficulty appeared. The prince, 
though transported with joy at the thought that Desiree was indeed to be his bride, was bitterly disappointed that she had not been allowed to return with Bikasig, as he had foolishly expected, and never having been taught to deny himself anything or to control his feelings, he fell as ill as he had done before. He would eat nothing nor take pleasure in anything, but lay all day on a heap of cushions, gazing at the picture of the princess. Adi. If I have to wait three months before I can marry the princess I shall die, was all this spoilt boy would say, and at length the king, in despair, resolved to send a fresh embassy to Desiree's father to implore him to permit the marriage to be celebrated at once. I would have presented my prayer in person, he added in his letter, but my great age and infirmities do not suffer me to travel, however my envoy has orders to agree to any arrangement that you may propose. On his arrival at the palace Bikasig pleaded his young master's cause as fervently as the king his father could have done, and entreated that the princess might be consulted in the matter. The queen hastened to the marble tower, and told her daughter of the sad state of the prince. Desiree sank down fainting at the noose, but soon came to herself again, and set about inventing a plan which would enable her to go to the prince without risking the doom pronounced over her by the wicked fairy. I see, she exclaimed joyfully at last. Let a carriage be built through which no light can come and let it be brought into my room. I will then get into it, and we can travel swiftly during the night and arrive before dawn at the palace of the prince. Once there, I can remain in some underground chamber, where no light can come. Adi. Ah, how clever you are, cried the queen, clasping her in her arms. And she hurried away to tell the king. What a wife our prince will have, a set Bikasig bowing low, but I must hasten back with the tidings, and to prepare the underground chamber for the princess. And so he took his leave. In a few days the carriage commanded by the princess was ready. It was of green velvet, scattered over with large golden thistles, and lined in sight with silver brocade embroidered with pink roses. It had no windows, of course, but the fairy Tulip, whose counsel had been asked, had managed to light it up with a soft glow that came no one knew whither. Adi. It was carried straight up into the great hall of the tower, and the princess stepped into it, followed by her faithful maid of honor, Iglantina, and by her lady-in-waiting Saraset who also had fallen in love with the prince's portrait and was bitterly jealous of her mistress. The fourth place in the carriage was filled by Saraset's mother, who had been sent by the queen to look after the three young people. Now the fairy of the fountain was the godmother of the princess Nera, to whom the prince had been betrothed before the picture of Desiree had made him faithless. She was very angry at the slight put upon her godchild, and from that moment kept careful watch on the princess. In this journey she saw her chance, and it was she who, invisible, sat by Saraset, and put bad thoughts into the minds of both her and her mother. The way to the city where the prince lived ran for the most part through a thick forest, and every night when there was no moon, and not a single star could be seen through the trees, the guards who traveled with the princess opened the carriage to give it an airing. This went on for several days, till only twelve hours' journey lay between them and the palace. The Saraset persuaded her mother to cut a great hole in the side of the carriage with a sharp knife which she herself had brought for the purpose. In the forest the darkness was so intense that no one perceived what she had done, but when they left the last trees behind them, and emerged into the open country, the sun was up, and for the first time since her babyhood, 
Desiree found herself in the light of day. She looked up in surprise at the dazzling brilliance that streamed through the hole, then gave a sigh which seemed to come from her heart. The carriage door swung back, as if by magic, and a white doe sprang out, and in a moment was lost to sight in the forest. But, quick as she was, Eglantina, her maid of honor, had time to see where she went, and jumped from the carriage in pursuit of her, followed at a distance by the guards. Sarah said and her mother looked at each other in surprise and joy. They could hardly believe in their good fortune, for everything had happened exactly as they wished. The first thing to be done was to conceal the hole which had been cut, and when this was managed, with the help of the angry fairy, though they did not know it, Sarah set hastened to take off her own clothes, and put on those of the princess, placing the crown of diamonds on her head. She found this heavier than she expected, but then, she had never been accustomed to wear crowns, which makes all the difference. Adi. At the gates of the city the carriage was stopped by a guard of honor sent by the king as an escort to his son's bride. Though Sarah said and her mother could of course see nothing of what was going on outside, they heard plainly the shouts of welcome from the crowds along the streets. The carriage stopped at length in the vast hall which Bikasig had prepared for the reception of the princess. The Grand Chamberlain and the Lord High Steward were awaiting her, and when the false bright stepped into the brilliantly lighted room, they bowed low, and said they had orders to inform His Highness the moment she arrived. The Prince, whom the strict etiquette of the court had prevented from being present in the underground hall, was burning with impatience in his own apartments. So she had come, cried he, throwing down the bow he had been pretending to mint. Well, was I not right? Is she not a miracle of beauty and grace? And has she her equal in the whole world? The ministers looked at each other, and made no reply, till at length the chamberlain, who was the bolder of the two, observed. My lord, as to her beauty, you can judge of that for yourself. No doubt it is as great as you say, but at present it seems to have suffered, as is natural, from the fatigues of the journey. Adi. This was certainly not what the prince had expected to hear. Could the portrait have flattered her? He had known of such things before, and a cold shiver ran through him, but with an effort he kept silent from further questioning, and only said. Has the king been told that the princess is in the palace? Yes, highness, and he has probably already joined her. Then I will go too, said the prince. Weak as he was from his long illness, the prince descended the staircase, supported by the ministers, and entered the room just in time to hear his father's loud cry of astonishment and disgust at the sight of Saraset. There was been treachery at work, he exclaimed, while the prince leant, dumb with horror, against the doorpost. But the lady-in-waiting, who had been prepared for something of the sort, advanced, holding in her hand the letters which the king and queen had entrusted to her. This is the princess Desiree, said she, pretending to have heard nothing, and I have the honor to present to you these letters from my liege lord and lady, together with the casket containing the princess, Jewitz. Adi. The king did not move or answer her, so the prince, leaning on the arm of Bikasig, approached a little closer to the false princess, hoping against hope that his eyes had deceived him. But the longer he looked the more he agreed with his father that there was treason somewhere, for in no single respect did the portrait resemble the woman before him. Saraset was so tall that the dress of the princess did not reach her ankles, 
and so thin that her bones showed through the stuff. Besides that her nose was hooked, and her teeth black and ugly. In his turn, the prince stood rooted to the spot. At last he spoke, and his words were addressed to his father, and not to the bride who had come so far to marry him. We have been deceived, he said, and it will cost me my life. And he leaned so heavily on the envoy that Bikasig feared he was going to faint, and hastily laid him on the floor. For some minutes no one could attend to anybody but the prince, but as soon as he revived the lady in waiting made herself hurt. Oh, my lovely princess, why did we ever leave home, cried she. But the king your father will avenge the insults that have been heaped on you when we tell him how you have been treated. Adi. I will tell him myself, replied the king in wrath. He promised me a wonder of beauty, he has sent me a skeleton. I am not surprised that he has kept her for fifteen years hidden away from the ice of the world. Take them both away, he continued, turning to his guards, and lodge them in the state prison. There is something more I have to learn of this matter. His orders were abate, and the prince, loudly bewailing his sat fate, was let back to bed, where for many days he lay in a high fever. At length he slowly began to gain strength, but his sorrow was still so great that he could not bear the sight of a strange face, and shuddered at the notion of taking his proper part in the court ceremonies. Unknown to the king, or to anybody but Bikasig, he planned that, as soon as he was able, he would make his escape and pass the rest of his life alone in some solitary place. It was some weeks before he had regained his health sufficiently to carry out his design, but finally, one beautiful starlight night, the two friends stole away, and when the king woke next morning he found a letter lying by his bed, saying that his son had gone, he knew not whither. He wept bitter tears at the news, for he loved the prince dearly, but he felt that perhaps the young man had done wisely, and he trusted to time and Bikasig's influence to bring the wanderer home. Adi. And while these things were happening, what had become of the white doe? Though when she sprang from the carriage she was aware that some unkind fate had changed her into an animal, yet, till she saw herself in a stream, she had no idea what it was. Is it really, e, désiré, she said to herself, weeping. What wicked fairy can have treated me so, and shall I never, never take my own shape again? My only comfort that, in this great forest, full of lions and serpents, my life will be a short one. Now the fairy Tulip was as much grieved at the sad fate of the princess as Desiree's own mother could have been if she had known of E.T. Still, she could not help feeling that if the king and queen had listened to her at this girl would by this time be safely in the wilds of her new home. However, she loved Desiree too much to let her suffer more than could be helped and it was she who guided Eglantine to the place where the white doe was standing, cropping the grass which was her dinner. At the sound of footsteps the pretty creature lifted her head, and when she saw her faithful companion approaching she bounded towards her, and rubbed her head on Eglantine's shoulder. The maid of honor was surprised, but she was fond of animals, and stroked the white doe tenderly, speaking gently to her all the while. Suddenly the beautiful creature lifted her head, and looked up into Eglantine's face, with tears streaming from her eyes. A thought flashed through her mind, and quick as lightning the girl flung herself on her knees, and lifting the animal's feet kissed them one by one. My princess! Oh my dear princess! cried she, and again the white doe rubbed her head against her, 
For thought the spiteful fairy had taken away her power of speech, she had not deprived her of her reason. Adi. All day long the two remained together, and when Eglantine grew hungry she was let by the white doe to a part of the forest where pears and peaches grew in abundance, but, as night came on, the maid of honor was filled with the terrors of wild beasts which had beset the princess during her first night in the forest. Is there no hut or cave we could go into? asked she. But the doe only shook her head, and the two sat down and wept with fright. The fairy Tulip, who, in spite of her anger, was very soft-hearted, was touched at their distress, and flew quickly to their help. I cannot take away the spell altogether, she said, for the fairy of the fountain is stronger than I, but I can shorten the time of your punishment, and am able to make it less hard, for as soon as darkness fall you shall resume your own shape, to think that by and by she would cease to be a white doe indeed, that she would at once cease to be one during the night was for the present joy enough for Desiree and she skipped about on the grass in the prettiest manner. Go straight down the path in front of you, continued the fairy, smiling as she watched her, go straight down the path and you will soon reach a little hut where you will find shelter. And with these words she vanished, leaving her hearers happier than they ever thought they could be again. An old woman was standing at the door of the hut when Eglantine drew near, with the white doe trotting by her sight. Good evening, she said, could you give me a night's lodging for myself and my doe? Certainly I can, replied the old woman. And she let them into a room with two little white beds, so clean and comfortable that it made you sleepy even to look at them. The door had hardly closed behind the old woman when the sun sank below the horizon, and Desiree became a girl again. Oh, Eglantina! What should I have done if you had not followed me, she cried. And she flung herself into her friend's arms in a transport of delight. Adi. Early in the morning Eglantine was awakened by the sound of someone scratching at the door, and on opening her eyes she saw the white doe struggling to get out. The little creature looked up and into her face, and nodded her head as the maid of honor unfastened the latch, but bounded away into the woods, and was lost to sight in a moment. Meanwhile, the prince and Bikasig were wandering through the wood, till at last the prince grew so tired, that he lay down under a tree, and told Bikasig that he had better go in search of food, and of some place where they could sleep. Bikasig had not gone very far, when a turn of the path brought him face to face with the old woman who was feeding her doves before her cottage. Could you give me some milk and fruit? asked he. I am very hungry myself, and, besides, I have left a friend behind me who is still weak from illness. Certainly I can, answered the old woman. But come and sit down in my kitchen while I catch the goat and milk e tea. Bikasig was glad enough to do as he was bid, and in a few minutes the old woman returned with a basket brimming over with oranges and grapes. Adi. If your friend has been ill he should not pass the night in the forest, said she. I have room in my hut tiny enough, it is true, but better than nothing and to that you are both heartily welcome. Bikasig thanked her warmly, and as by this time it was almost sunset, he set out to fetch the prince. It was while he was absent that Eglantine and the white doe entered the hut, and having, of course, no idea that in the very next room was the man whose childish impatience had been the cause of all their troubles. In spite of his fatigue, the prince slept badly, and directly it was light he rose, and bidding Bikasig remain where he was, as he wished to be alone, he strolled out into the forest. 
He walked on slowly, just as his fancy led him, till, suddenly, he came to a white open space, and in the middle was the white doe quietly eating her breakfast. She bounded off at the sight of a man, but not before the prince, who had fastened on his bow without thinking, had let fly several arrows, which the fairy tulip took care should do her no harm. But, quickly as she ran, she soon felt her strength failing her, for fifteen years of life in a tower had not taught her how to exercise her limbs. Luckily, the prince was too weak to follow her far, and a turn of a path brought her close to the hut, where Eglantine was awaiting her. Panting for breath, she entered the room, and flung herself down on the floor. Adi. When it was dark again, and she was once more the Princess Desiree, she told Eglantine what had befallen here. I feared the fairy of the fountain, and the cruel beasts, said she, but somehow I never thought of the dangers that I ran from men. I do not know now what saved me. You must stay quietly here till the time of your punishment is over, answered Eglantine. But when the morning dawned, and the girl turned into a doe, the longing for the forest came over her, and she sprang away as before. As soon as the prince was awake he hastened to the place where, only the day before, he had found the white doe feeding, but of course she had taken care to go in the opposite direction. Much disappointed, he tried first one green path and then another, and at last, weary with walking, he threw himself down and went fast asleep. Just at this moment the white doe sprang out of a thicket nearby, and started back trembling when she beheld her enemy lying there. Yet, instead of turning to fly, something bade her go and look at him unseen. As she gazed a thrill ran through her, for she felt that, worn and wasted though he was by illness, it was the face of her destined husband. Gently stooping over him she kissed his forehead, and at her touch he awoke. Adi. For a minute they looked at each other, and to his amazement he recognized the white doe which had escaped him the previous day. But in an instant the animal was aroused to a sense of her danger, and she fled with all her strength into the thickest part of the forest. Quick as lightning the prince was on her track, but this time it was with no wish to kill or even wound the beautiful creature. Pretty doe! Pretty doe! Stop! I won't hurt you, cried he, but his words were carried away by the wind. At length the doe could run no more, and when the prince reached her, she was lying stretched out on the grass, waiting for her death blow. But instead the prince knelt at her sight, and stroked her, and bade her fear nothing, as he would take care of her. So he fetched a little water from the stream in his horn hunting cup, then, cutting some branches from the trees, he twisted them into a litter which he covered with moss, and laid the white doe gently on E.T. For a long time they remained thus, but when Desiree saw by the way that the light struck the trees, that his sun must be near its setting, she was filled with alarm lest the darkness should fall, and the prince should behold her in her human shape. Adi. No, he must not see me for the first time here, she thought, and instantly began to plan how to get rid of him. Then she opened her mouth and let her tongue hang out, as if she were dying of thirst, and the prince, as she expected, hastened to the stream to get her some more water. When he returned, the white doe was gone. That night Desiree confessed to Eglantine that her pursuer was no other than the prince, and that far from flattering him, the portrait had never done him justice. Is it not hard to meet him in this shape, wept she, when we both love each other so much? 
but Eglantine comforted her, and reminded her that in a short time all would be well. The prince was very angry at the flight of the white doe, for whom he had taken so much trouble, and returning to the cottage he poured out his adventures and his wrath to be Cassig, who could not help smiling. She shall not escape me again, cried the prince. If I hunt her every day for a year, I will have her at last. And in this frame of mind he went to bed. Adi. When the white doe entered the forest next morning, she had not made up her mind whether she would go and meet the prince, or whether she would shun him, and hide in thickets of which he knew nothing. She decided that the last plan was the best, and so it would have been if the prince had not taken the very same direction in search of her. Quite by accident he caught sight of her white skin shining through the bushes, and at the same instant she heard a twig snap under his feet. In a moment she was up and away, but the prince, not knowing how else to capture her, aimed an arrow at her leg, which brought her to the ground. The young man felt like a murderer as he ran hastily up to where the white doe lay, and did his best to soothe the pain she felt, which, in reality, was the last part of the punishment sent by the fairy of the fountain. First he brought her some water, and then he fetched some healing herbs, and having crushed them in his hand, laid them on the wound. Ah! What a wretch I was to have hurt you, cried he, resting her head upon his knees, and now you will hate me and fly from me forever. For some time the doe lay quietly where she was, but, as before, she remembered that the hour of her transformation was near. She struggled to her feet, but the prince would not hear of her walking, and thinking the old woman might be able to dress her wound better than he could, he took her in his arms to carry her back to the hut. But, small as she was, she made herself so heavy that, after staggering a few steps under her weight, he laid her down, and tied her fast to a tree with some of the ribbons of his hat. This done he went away to get help. Meanwhile Eglantine had grown very uneasy at the long absence of her mistress, and had come out to look for her. Just as the prince passed out of sight the fluttering ribbons danced before her eyes, and she described her beautiful princess bound to a tree. With all her might she worked at the knots, but not a single one could she undo, though all appeared so easy. She was still busy with them when a voice behind her said, Pardon me, fair lady, but it is M. Wido you are trying to steal. Pray, noble knight, responded Eglantine with a mere fleeting acknowledgement, but it is unequivocally my doe that is tethered here. If you seek evidence, ascertain whether she recognizes me or not. My dear creature, she continued, descending to her niece, extend your trust to me. The doe, in response, raised its forefoot and gently placed it upon Eglantine's sight. Now, encircle my neck with your arms and exhale a sigh. Once again, the doe obediently followed her command. You speak the truth, admitted the prince with a tinge of regret. Yet, I part with her reluctantly, for despite my having wounded her, my affection for her remains profound. Eglantina, Hulvifa, chose silence in response. Carefully lifting the doe, she guided it gradually towards the dwelling. Unbeknownst to both the prince and Bikasig, the old woman harbored more than just their company. Observing from a distance, they were taken aback witnessing Eglantine and her companion entering the cottage. Eager for answers, they interrogated the old woman, who professed ignorance regarding the lady and her albino doe. 
She, however, assured them of their quiet demeanor and generous compensation before retreating to her kitchen. Do you realize, queried Bikasig in their solitude, that the lady we glimpsed is none other than the maid of honor to Princess Desiree, whom I encountered at the palace? Given her proximity, a discreet orifice in the wall could confirm my suspicion. Drawing a knife from his pocket, he commenced carving through the woodwork. The girls, hearing the grating noise but attributing it to a mere mouse, paid no heat, leaving Bikasig undisturbed in his endeavors. Eventually, a peephole large enough for observation emerged, revealing a spectacle that left him dumbfounded. His conjecture was accurate, the tall lady was indeed Eglantina. Yet, the other where had he encountered her? A realization struck him she was the lady from the portrait. Desiree, adorned in a flowing gown of green silk, reclined upon cushions. As Eglantine tended to her wounded leg, she lamented, let me perish rather than endure this existence. The agony of being a creature throughout the day, unable to communicate with the man I love, whose impatience sealed my cruel fate. Yet, even so, I cannot bring myself to despise him. These uttered words, though spoken in hushed tones, reached Bikasig, who could scarcely believe his ears. He stood in silence for a moment before leading the prince to the window, where he could witness the scene for himself. A single glance confirmed that it was, indeed, Desiree. The circumstances surrounding the arrival of another bearing her name at the palace were of no immediate concern to him. Quietly exiting the room, he knocked on the adjacent door, which Eglantine opened, anticipating the arrival of their supper. Upon seeing the prince, recognition dawned on Eglantine. He, however, disregarded her, prostrating himself at Desiree's feet, pouring out the depths of his heart. As dawn approached, they continued their conversation. It was only when the sun reached its zenith that the princess realized she retained her human form. Overwhelmed with joy upon realizing the end of her enchantment, she enthusiastically recounted the tale of her transformation to the prince. Thus, the narrative concluded on a positive note. The fairy Tulip, revealed as the old woman of the hut, orchestrated a wedding feast for the young couple, unparalleled in its grandeur. Everyone rejoiced, except for Sarasad and her mother, who found themselves relegated to a small island, where they toiled for their sustenance.